Hi Shreya, hope you'll enjoy this video of our trip to Bristol. England by train is so picturesque, though you'll have to forgive Amit trying in vain to capture his reflection on the window glass. Bristol is charming, a seaside town growing every day. But I have a very special reason for sending it to you. It has a surprise in it for you and your grandma. For we were in Bristol for an unusual occasion, a date with Indian history. You know how much the British love and treasure the past. Bristol has an old cemetery called Arnaud's Vale where the mausoleum of Raja Ram Mohan Roy stands, built in his memory by his friend and compatriot Prince Dwarkanath Tagore. On 27 September every year, that's where they remember Ram Mohan's death anniversary. Even today, 165 years later. We have managed to raise the money to... Rita. Thank you. Lant, who invited the Raja to Bristol, Mary, who was enthused by the Raja, never said very much in front of him. She was only a girl of 25. But later on, she wrote the definitive last days in England of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And Hi, Dida. How are you? I've got something to tell you. Nandini sent me the DVD of Raja Ram Mohan Roy's annual memorial service. You must come and see it. My grandmother, my link to the past since my first Brahmo Samaj prayer meeting on her lap, encouraged me to rediscover Ram Mohan, India's first modern savant. He was also a successful trader, a man of letters, philosopher, politician, and a social reformer who founded the Brahmo Samaj. I followed her lead and went off in search of him to a museum dedicated to him. It was a revelation. Through the sunset of the Mughal and the dawn of the British Empire in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, he became one of the architects of modern India in many more ways than one. The Ram Mohan I discovered seemed more an enigma than a historical character. He emerged as a colossus, straddling two eventful centuries, both witness to phenomenal change when our ancient civilization met with the West. Potentially, it could have meant a serious conflict of civilizations, like the experience of our own times. But Ram Mohan found a unique creative opportunity where new worlds enriched old ones with thoughts and ideas that transformed the quality of our lives. The museum was not enough, so I hit the road towards his family's ancestral seat in Radhanagar, about a hundred odd kilometers away in Hookley. What I saw left me in awe. Even after two centuries, the ambience spelt power and wealth. Ram Mohan's father, Ramakanto, was a feudal lord, loyal to the Mughal rulers in Delhi. An air of devotion seemed to linger here, so I wasn't surprised to know that Ramakanto's politics never interfered with his faith as a devout Vaishnavite. His wife, Tarani Devi, though, came from a Shakta background. In those days, it was an unusual match, and I could sense that this duality between the two major schools of Hindu faith must have had its influence on Ram Mohan's upbringing. These walls seem to tell me the story of how Ram Mohan grew up to be both a man of the world, a trader and administrator, as well as a man of thought, a philosopher and social reformer. 
He was born on 22nd May 1772, seven years after the East India Company procured the Diwani of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa from the Mughal Badshah. It also brought about the effective end of Nawabi rule in Bengal. Here, among the Radhanagar ruins, I understood scholar-historian Brojain Shield's description of Ram Mohan's times. The darkest age in modern Indian history, an old society and polity had crumbled down and a new one had not yet been built in its place. Devastation reigned in the land. All vital limbs of society were paralyzed. All were in chaotic condition. My journey into this dark age started with my grandmother's advice to meet scholars, read books, and look at paintings and woodcuts. Brahmin monopoly on religious texts left flagrant misinterpretations unchallenged by lay believers, already divided severely by caste. Idolatry and orthodox rituals nurtured barbaric practices like the burning of widows. When Warren Hastings shifted the capital from Murshidabad, it signaled the rise of the British Empire in Calcutta. Beyond it, a great famine devastated the villages of Bengal. If you look at the socio-political background in which Ram Mohan was born in 1772, as long ago as that, that was the year when the English East India Company established a governorship in Bengal. Warren Hastings, who later, two years later, became the governor general of Bengal. So these are the earliest days of the British Sarkar in mm -hmm. India. Few years before Ram Mohan was born, his father had taken part in a rebellion against the English East India Company on behalf of the last of the Mughal emperors, who was then Shahzada Ali Gohar, later called Shah Alam II. Ram Mohan's father had fought for the Raja of Bordhaman, whose loyal feudal vassal he was. And these people, at the Battle of the Bankab River, just outside Bodhavan town, had made a desperate stand against British rule. Ram Mohan, of course, was born in an age when the Zamindars of Bengal had accepted the company's rule. Tradition, however, gave him a Sanskrit education, backed up with Arabic and Persian, the court language. By his teens, he was fluent in all three Asian languages, along with his mother tongue, Bengali. But it is interesting to remember that pretty early in his life, he chafed against his family's practices and became what in religious history we call the Ramata tradition, the Ramta Shadhu tradition. That is, a person who in search of religious understanding and meditative practices roams all over India. Ram Mohan has said in his autobiographical fragment that he traveled around northern India and perhaps southern India and certainly into Tibet of those days in the late 18th century, picking up not just Hindu learning but also the learning in Arabic about the Quran the learning in Persian about secular matters of governance and the learning that was available in the Tantras, which were being read in far off Nepal and Tibet. His early reading of the Quran shook his faith in Hindu idolatry and founded his lifelong admiration of the strict monotheism of Islam. With time and maturity, he was also drawn to Sufi mysticism with its poignant expression in Persian poetry 
and its resonance with tenets of the Vedanta. Sufism in Bengal had deep and popular roots. And then the point is that by the end of the 18th century, Ram Mohan comes back and he does not come back to a life of religion like the sadhus. He does not become a sadhu. He becomes a Dewan for an English East India Company's official, Digby. In 1805, Ram Mohan writes this Persian tract with the first page of invocation in Arabic. It's called the Tawfat ul Muahiddin. Tawfat, a present. Tofa. ul Muahiddin. Those who believe in the unity of the deity. A gift to believers in the unity of the deity. So was that track a kind of manifesto for Ram Mohan? Yes, of course. Of course, you're right. That this is what he is going to preach all his life. He's coming towards the end of his service career. In another 11 years, he is going to retire and settle down in Kolkata in 1814 uh, or 16, I forget the exact date. And it is a manifesto for him that he is now talking in terms of democracy and the right to honor. Ram Mohan's lifelong admiration for historic landmarks like the American War of Independence and the French Revolution came with his Rangpur experience, along with new linguistic skills opening windows to European enlightenment and the values of liberty and equality. My journey with Ram Mohan led me to 1815 and to Calcutta, where he had lived earlier from 1797 to 1804. This was the city that would witness his major lifetime achievements. His villa in the Maniktala suburbs was the scene of his major work as the translator of the Vedanta, Upanishads and other texts. His villa is now, ironically, the police museum. But once, this was where Calcutta's intellectual elite, both European and Indian, participated in discussion and debate. Its contents form the intellectual basis of his later work as a social and religious reformer. I discovered more at his Calcutta townhouse, which has recently been restored into a museum dedicated to him. I was surprised again and again by the unusual facets of his character and his concerns. I was surprised how much of what my generation and I believe in stems from what he first dared to think. <laughs> The walls of the museum reverberate with songs he composed and stimulating debates he set in motion. It is here that he brought together the Atyo Shabha, an association for disseminating religious understanding and tolerance. Participants included Bengal's intellectual and social elite, like Prince Dwarkanath Tagore and Kalinath Munshi. ग्रंथे समसामयिक विभिन्न पंडित संगे तरह वितर्क भट्टाचार्य सहित विचार उत्सवानंद विद्यावाशी सहित विचार कवित सहित विचार सुब्रमण्य शास्त्री सहित विचार ये बीगुलो यगल खूब एक हिसाब से सामयिक एक वितर्कमूलक रचना पलेमिक टेखा से ही समय कतगुलो सामाजिक धर्मियों संस्कार के केंद्र को गड़े उठे 
বিশেষ করে আমরা জানি যে রামমোহন সহমরণ প্রথার বিরোধিতা করেছিলেন তার সহমরণ বিষয়ক যে দুটি পুস্তিকা রয়েছে প্রবর্তক নিবর্তক সংবাদ তার মধ্যে তিনি সেই কালটাকে তুলে ধরার চেষ্টা করছেন এবং সমকালের যে প্রতিকূলতা প্রতিবাদ তার মধ্যে দেখা দিয়েছে সেই সময় তার বিরুদ্ধাচরণ সেটা শুধু ব্যক্তিগত বিরুদ্ধাচরণ নয় এটা মনে রাখতে হবে যে রামমোহন ব্যক্তিগতভাবে কোনো কারুর শত্রুতা মনে পোষণ করেননি বা করতেন না তিনি একটা আদর্শ যে আদর্শটা ওই যুক্তি সাহায্যে মনস্বিতার সাহায্যে মননের সাহায্যে উপস্থিত করার চেষ্টা করছে Among his numerous interactions is the famous encounter with the southern scholar Subramanya Shastri. This was part of his larger campaign to confront and engage with a powerful and entrenched Hindu orthodoxy. He inaugurated an unknown spirit of freedom and rationality in theological discussions. My encounter with the museum's mural on Sati was a strong reminder of Ram Mohan's personal crusade against a barbaric custom much of the world justifiably remembers him by his spirited fight against the forced immolation of hindu widows in their husbands funeral pyre memories of a film seen in childhood return to me through its moving images durpunne amade sargobash hobe mrittu to achi karur age कृपाएंगी ंजन A deeply entrenched ritual, sati was condoned by faith and guarded by vested interests. The movement for its abolition began with Ram Mohan's personal experience, the immolation of his brother Jagmohan's widow in 1811. The site of that barbaric ritual is today hallowed ground because this is where Ram Mohan swore to fight relentlessly. for the abolition of sati Ram Mohan's powerful writings his vast classical scholarship 
and his impeccable credentials gave considerable leverage to the eventual ban on sati, legalized on 4th December 1829 by Lord Bentinck. The practice of sati or of burning or burying alive the widows of Hindus is revolting to the feelings of human nature. It is nowhere enjoined by the religion of the Hindus as an imperative duty. In those in which it has been most frequent, it is notorious that in many instances, acts of atrocity have been perpetrated which have been shocking to the Hindus themselves and in their eyes unlawful and wicked. The practice of sati or of burning or burying alive the widows of Hindus is hereby declared illegal and punishable by the criminal courts. The Orthodox Hindu community retaliated with loud protests. Supported by powerful community leaders like Radhakanto Dev, the matter went up to the Privy Council in London. Ram Mohan's liberalism even challenged the Christian faith. In 1820, he published Precepts of Jesus, in which he delinked the moral message of Christ from specific Christian reliance on miracle stories. The missionaries were at once up in arms against the daring heathen, but Ram Mohan's courage never wavered. My research gave no clues to Ram Mohan's Unitarian mission, except the interview in the video from Bristol. The Raja, of course, called himself a Hindu Unitarian by 1826. Uh, therefore, the Unitarians worldwide were very interested in him. And the Unitarian magazines went from America to Britain to India and everywhere else. So everybody who was in the missionary field, and the Unitarians were in the missionary field in Calcutta, knew about the Raja. Now, the question was, who gained from whom? And I think, actually, they both did. The Unitarians gained in the sense that the Brahmo Samaj developed later on, according to Keshav Chandra Sen, along slightly different lines. But they never forgot the, the Raja's interest in Unitarianism. The Unitarian mission evolved into the Brahmo Sabha in 1828. Even as a child, I knew from my grandma that it was Ram Mohan who wrote the original trust deed, on the basis of which the Brahmo Samaj came into being. It came as the culmination of a lifetime's endeavor by one who was as much a man of action as a man of thought and letters. My grandma told me how Ram Mohan's scholarship revealed that the Hindu scriptures gave women rights equal to men. This brought great legitimacy to the support of the movement for women's rights, especially to own property, to remarry after widowhood, and to education as a means to empowerment. He contributed not only towards making me what I am today, but also in liberating women of her generation. To get back to your question that uh, mm, uh, um, that, uh, I mean, uh, what exactly is Ramon's relevance today? Of course, one of the obvious things would be, I mean, we would say that uh, uh, he tried to synthesize. He tried to synthesize uh, Hinduism, uh, Christianity, and Islam. Certainly, you know, a lot of Islam. And uh, this synthesis, see, 
I think if we uh, analyze the synthesis, not go into the texts of the synthesis, but analyze the act of the synthesis, then we'll probably see that there was a basis uh, of tolerance, you know, and in a time when intolerance is, uh, is, is so rampant, intolerance of every kind, not just religious intolerance, but also political intolerance, intolerance of ideology, we can see a, 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 a sort of, you know, a seed of tolerance that he was trying to uh, um, preach tolerance and, uh, by bringing these religions or religious ideologies together. That Prothom Jeboi Bidanto Grunthu, Munirakthavi Jokun Lekhauche, Atrosho Puneru, Tokunopotun to Bangla, Guddo Ado, Manesar Shuishabe, Padaini, Guddo Tokun Tuidioche, Guddo Nirmioman Guddo, Ado, Bangla Guddo Bolekunuchi Tokun Chilon, a Shaiti Guddo Bolekichi Chilon. Folly. এই বেদান্ত গ্রন্থের শুরুতেই তিনি একেবারে নির্দেশ দিয়েছেন যে কিভাবে গদ্য লিখতে হবে কিভাবে গদ্য পড়তে হবে অর্থাৎ এই যে আমরা বাংলা গদ্য এখনকার দিনে স্বাভাবিক পাঙ্কচুয়েশন চিহ্ন অনুসারে অর্থাৎ ছেদ চিহ্ন অনুসারে আমরা পড়ে যাই কমা সেমিকোলন দাড়ি এগুলো দিয়ে আমরা একটা বাক্যকে তৈরি করি কিন্তু রামমোহন যখন গদ্য লিখছেন সে সময় তখন আদৌ কোনো পাঙ্কচুয়েশন চিহ্ন ছিল না আজকে দিনে যে কারণে রামমোহনের গদ্য পড়তে আমাদের একটু কষ্ট হয় একটু অসুবিধা হয় সেই জন্য প্রথমেই তিনি বলে নিচ্ছেন ওই বেদান্ত গ্রন্থের গোড়াতেই যে গদ্য রচনা গদ্য পাঠের রীতি প্রকরণটা কি হবে বাক্যের প্রারম্ভ আর সমাপ্তি এই দুয়ের বিবেচনা বিশেষ মতে করিতে উচিত হয় যে যে স্থানে যখন যাহা যেমন ইত্যাদি শব্দ আছে তাহার প্রতিশব্দ তখন তাহা সেই রূপ ইত্যাদিকে পূর্বের সহিত অন্যায় করিয়া বাক্যের শেষ করিবেন এই যে কি করে বাক্য তৈরি করতে হয় অর্থাৎ আমাদের মননের ভাষা রামমোহন তৈরি করে দিয়ে গেলেন he wrote a very famous letter to Lord Amherst in 1823. Uh, a thing that uh, Ramon was trying to say in the, in the letter that, you know, it's not just English. English is simply a vehicle, you see. English is some kind of a medium. It's not English education for English education's sake. But he wanted English, I mean, certainly he was, you know, he wanted English as, see, a vehicle for natural sciences, for science, for he mentioned chemistry, he mentions mathematics, you see. And since, uh, uh, you know, this was a time when all the ancient sources of the sciences, see, we rediscovered Indian science, ancient Indian science, ancient Indian scientific texts later, see. Um, since all this were, uh, let's say, in some kind of dormant condition, you see, Ramon was probably right to think that uh, English would be is the, the right uh, instrument mm -hmm. through which, see, uh, new education can come. Unfortunately, you know, what came was Macaulay. And what Macaulay wanted was not science, not natural sciences, not, say, uh, rationality, not, uh, let's say, 18th century uh, uh, reason, you mm -hmm. see, uh, but uh, English educated clerks, see, mm -hmm. who do the work for us. That was Macaulay's uh, famous minute. Though the pioneering voice of Ram Mohan in education, led to the foundation of the Hindu College on 20th January 1817. His name does not appear in the founding committee. But I would like to emphasize that throughout this concern with religion, Ram Mohan is carrying on what was called, what I think you yourself said, was his early manifesto. 
a manifesto of political equalization with the forces of colonialism. The two famous things uh, for which he is known, the first is uh, his uh, criticism of the gagging of the press. Amherst, the man whose name was later to be given to the street on which he lived, uh, governor general in Bengal in the early 1820s, was responsible for an ordinance which tried to say that various groups of Indians could not express their views as openly as they wished. The British, when they came to power, were accepted with pulchandun, flowers and sandalwood paste in celebration because they were seen as the harbingers of a new destiny. Was it this destiny, the note says, which is going to gag the minds of those who are looking for modernity? No. And what does he do? He stops publishing the paper, the, one of the first newspapers to come out in Kolkata, in an Indian language. Now, it is significant that this paper is not in Bengali. Ram Mohan is writing in the language of his Mughal forebears. It's called the Miratul Akhbar, Akhbar News. And he stops the publication of Miratul Akhbar in protest against uh, the ordinance. So, in a sense, Ram Mohan is one of the earliest people who is teaching us the virtues of nonviolent protest. Not just waving one's sword and dying fighting, but of living to fight another day and to protest yet another day. This is the message that is going to grow in the 19th century in moderate nationalism all over India. Ram Mohan left for England on 19th November 1830 to reach its shores on 18th April 1831. His long voyage was distinguished by his encounter with the French tricolour flying on a vessel in the high seas. His excitement and insistence that he be carried on board the French ship, despite his indisposition, shows his enthusiasm for the values he associated with the revolution. It is from England that he can learn more about the principles of modern liberty. He wants to go to the home of parliamentary democracy. He wants to learn how parliamentary democracy can be brought to it. And he's prepared even to do this as an emissary of the broken down Mughal Empire. Shah Alam has given way, blinded, and toothless in 1803 to a new emperor, so-called. He's no more an emperor, Akbar II, who is just a pensioner of the British. This person, fighting for the rights of his family and privileges, having been expropriated largely by the Marathas and the British, is now appealing to the crown to see that his rights and privileges are maintained. He confers the title of Raja on Ram Mohan. We forget this. Ram Mohan was given the title of Raja by the Mughals. Again, the same message is being repeated, the same duality between the late Mughals and the early British. And Ram Mohan goes to England to plead the Mughal case in Parliament. The British treat that with contempt. Where he does not receive contempt in his journey to England is from the common middle class in London or in Bristol or in other parts of England that he visited. I think what he did was, in Britain anyway, as well partly in Calcutta, was he astounded the British people. You cannot run an empire 
by thinking that the people that you are ruling are as good, if not better, than you, because you just wouldn't be there. But when the Raja appeared, and when he spoke, I think the great British public realised the quality of the man, the quality of what the Bengali Renaissance was producing at the time, the quality of intellect, because not only was he skilled in uh, his own Vedic background, uh, in Islam as well, but he understood the nuances of the West. And I think it was that that absolutely amazed the British public. He lectured, he spoke, he went into the Houses of Parliament, he gave evidence to the Privy Council, all of whom listened to him with, I'm not exaggerating, awe and admiration. And that is a very great beginning. That's Kala Contractor, Dida. She's an amateur historian. She's devoted her life to the glorification and research of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. She is wonderful. It is she who leads the ceremonies every year on 26 the September. Raja can be taken as a multicultural icon for our 21st century. And that, I think, is a very important position. Each generation looks for something different in a hero of a previous generation. Yeah, hi.